Hi everybody, now in English, Daniel Spatz from California. Welcome to my tennis show. We are doing, we already conducted more than 50 interviews in the past uh, about 50 days, 60 days. So it's been wonderful, wonderful time. Today we had uh, earlier uh, Marat Dinara Safina, there you go. I want to give him the welcome. Hey, Jay. How's it going? Good to see you, man. Thank you so much for, for your time. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. No, it's fantastic. We, today was a special day. I had uh, Dinara Safina earlier. Uh, it's not easy to talk to the former number one. <laughs> Yeah, you can just add a couple more zeros to my, my best ranking. So uh, you're not going to get a Grand Slam champion today, but hopefully we'll, uh, we'll deliver some great value to everyone listening. But you, 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 are a, you are, to me, a Grand Slam a champion in life. Well, thank you. Because I, I was following your career, you know, pretty much in tennis. When you're in tennis, you follow everybody. So uh, thanks again, Jeff. So where are you right now? What are you staying right now i'm in denver i'm in denver colorado uh when okay. i retired from the tour in 2007 uh, or 2008 i moved back home i grew up i grew up in denver colorado that it's not exactly a tennis hotbed like argentina or uh, spain or florida or california so yep making my home here jeff i see your uh screen not as clear as it should uh, okay. The internet connection is not. Could you see me well? I can see you well. I can try to make a change. Do you want me to make a make an adjustment? Please. Okay. Let me see. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, we're gonna go back with Jeff soon. Want to make sure the connection is clear and you guys can have a good, good time. With Jeff, Jeff is, is uh, former top 100 in ATP, 2004, 68 in doubles. Interestingly, she, he was uh, uh, top 60 something in doubles before. First, then he has some injuries. Okay, he left. He's gonna come back soon. Um, three years after uh, joining the tour. Uh, uh, yeah. Let me just uh, check this. Okay. I can, I can see you better now. Is it better? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm in the green room here. I love it. So I'm, I can, and you can see some books in the, behind me in my back. So, awesome. So, yeah, I'm in California, so we, we are not that... Uh, Far right now, right? <laughs> right. Where in California are you? Irvine. Awesome. Yeah, near Newport Beach. Uh, yeah, I moved here in 2018. I was an IMG Academy couple, but it, it's a long story. It's not about me. It's about you. Sure. So you, uh, it's funny. I was following, you know, studying about your tennis career. You were a very good junior player, Jeff. Right? I mean, well, I was were, good. I was good when I was 12. Uh, I, I was good when I was 12. I won the nationals, but when I was 15, I was not good. And uh, that's part of my story. And I think those that are listening can relate uh, to the adversity and the struggles. I wasn't this superstar at 16. I wasn't groomed to be a professional to win grand slam titles. So I have a slightly different story to share uh, with those that are listening. Yeah, go ahead because it's, it's, yeah. it's incredible that you were you said you were very good at twelve and then not good in not good in sixteen. Yeah, so so my father was my first coach. He was a USPTA professional. He played Division One tennis in Colorado. He wasn't a great player, but he he understood the game and he taught and he got me started at age five. And I was kind of a natural. I was a very good athlete. I had good hand eye coordination. My dad gave me the fundamentals, but then my parents split. Uh, they got divorced. I moved to Denver with my mother. Uh, single mother, uh, she, I would either walk to the courts or she would drop me off. And I just had that hunger to be great. Uh, mm -hmm. And at age nine, I was number one in the state. My mom remarried. My stepfather played for the great Trinity teams with Chuck McKinley and Frank Froling, Miles Cortez. He was, 
he was he was playing seven eight for them. He didn't even start. But uh, I had two fathers that played a lot of tennis, coached tennis, helped me with my game. And so yeah, I found myself at twelve years old winning the nationals and beating all these kids from from Florida. You know, Vince Spadia, who went on to be twenty in the mm. world, Brian Dunn. Uh, who was a national, you know, world champion before he had to end his career with with uh, injury, and then. But when I was fifteen, uh, I hadn't grown. I was five foot four, one hundred and two pounds as a at fifteen and a half. Everyone had gone through puberty. I was in Colorado. I was still playing basketball and skiing, and really wasn't a full time player like some of the others. And and I lost first round at Kalamazoo. Uh, first round singles, first round doubles, first round uh, consolation. So that's a triple crown that you don't want to have. And uh, I can tell you right now, I, at 15, 16 years old, there was probably, there wasn't one person in the world that thought I would end up and play pro tennis, let alone play for 11 years. And so uh, I was a bit of a surprise, but I, I recommitted to tennis. I got my fundamentals back. I started working with a different coach. I grew physically. <laughs> And I always had that mind, you know, I had the mind and I had the technique. And so I, I, when I grew, I was able to reestablish my ranking and go play for Dick Gould at Stanford. But again, when I was recruited there, I was their third recruit. So I wasn't their number one. I wasn't their number two. I was their number three. And if you went by the rankings on the team, I was slated to play number seven my freshman year. And so I wasn't even predicted to start for, for Mighty Stanford. And I went in, I won challenge matches, and I ended up playing number five singles. And my freshman year, I was 22 and four with no serve, no serve whatsoever. I couldn't break 100 miles an hour. I was a lefty, but I was that lefty, that cagey lefty that just would slide the ball in and start the point. I wasn't getting any aces. I wasn't getting any free points. And so playing number five singles was right where I needed to be. But something happened between my freshman and sophomore year in college that was very unique and very different. You know, my career has been very unique and very different. That's why I think I'm, you know, an experienced coach now that can help a lot of players. But I was playing the satellites. You probably remember the satellites yeah. in the summer. And I was playing the first week was in Lafayette, Louisiana. The second week was maybe Waco, Texas. The third week might have been Austin. I can't remember the fourth week, but I played all three weeks. And actually, you mentioned IMG. Max mm. Mirny was on that satellite as a, as a, I was 19. He was probably 16 years old and he was just starting out. And so, you know, here I am, the kid from Colorado, and I can't even get out of the qualifying rounds mm. of these satellites. So imagine being, you know, you think about all the great players that came through IMG and all the players that you've seen. By the time they're 19, they're usually top 300, top 200, even top 100 in the world. Yeah. And I couldn't get one ATP point as a 19-year-old. And so I think it speaks to everybody has a different path. Everyone has a different story. And when I lost three weeks in a row, I didn't make it to the final week, the, the, the Masters uh, for the fourth week of the Satellite. And so I had a decision to make. Do I go play the next circuit in the Midwest, Springfield and St. Joe's and Indianapolis or Columbus, somewhere in the Midwest? And I said, no, I'm not going to follow the herd. I'm not going to play with all the college players because my serve stinks. I've got to figure out my serve. So I, I flew home to Denver, Colorado. I watched Goran Ivanisevic on TV playing at Wimbledon in 1993. He had uh, got into the finals the year before. I think he lost to Agassi. So I watched him serve. He's left-handed. And this was before YouTube, before Instagram, before video analysis, before coaches had videos for you. And I watched him and I said, you know what? I'm just going to try and copy Goran. So I went out to the courts with my hopper and every single day I hit hoppers. of. Sorry, of yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. When you were playing those tournaments, you were you were traveling with a coach or just by, you, by, by yourself? I was traveling with another player at Stanford, so it was kind of like I knew I was gonna I knew I was gonna play four years at college because I wasn't gonna play pro tennis. I was gonna get my degree in economics and get a real job. There was no, but I I wanted the experience, and you know that's what you did in the summer back then. So I go back home, and all summer I just hit hoppers of serves, and one day something clicked. I don't know if I got bigger and stronger. I don't know if my momentum changed, but I added 15 to 20 miles, 20 miles an hour to my serve. And I remember going back that fall 
and Coach Gould and John Whitlinger were watching me play, and it was almost like I was a different player. And they looked at me, and they're like, what did you do? And I said, I don't know. I just watched Goron. And so they said, well, you're going to play number two this year, number two singles. You're going to jump three guys, and you're going to play number two. And that was kind of my coming out party. That was my first where I, now I had a weapon. Now I could serve in volley. Coach Gould had me serving in volleying. And so I played two singles my sophomore year. We lost in the finals of the NCAAs. And I lost the deciding match for the team championship to USC, to John Leach. And it was a devastating loss. Mm -hmm. uh, but I came back hungry the next year. I played number one my junior and senior year. We went undefeated my junior year. I had Scott Humphreys and Paul Goldstein and Jim Thomas on my team, four ATP players. And we went undefeated my junior year. I was a team captain and senior year. We also won the national championship. And then I turned pro. And I now had this big serve. And I know we're going to talk about the serve more at some point. Yeah. But I wanted to give everyone some context about how much I transformed at mm. 19, 20 years old when most people would give up or most people would say, well, it's not in mm. the cards. I always stayed curious. I always wanted to learn. I always wanted to figure things out. And uh, that allowed me to have a successful college career and have a chance to play pro tennis. Fantastic, Jeff. Uh, so uh, what was the first thing? Do you remember the first thing that you were trying to change? Was the toss, the arm movement? What a Share yeah, so, so I, I like to say that I had two transformations with my serve. One was the one I just mentioned. The second one when I was 28, when I switched from a pinpoint stance to a platform stance, and I started okay. to model Pete Sampras more. And that was with a coach. A coach helped me with that. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But this first change, you know, when you look, think of Goran Ivanisevic, mm. he had a low toss. Mm -hmm. And he also really rocked back on his back foot. And he, it's almost like he, he thrusted himself into the court with, you know, with that momentum starting all the way on the back foot. So I think I started leaning back more. And, and I kind of, you know, I brought up my arm kind of like an archer like him. And then mm -hmm. I just tossed it out in front and I just went and got it. And, and there wasn't much technique other than changing the momentum and my weight transfer um, and then just something clicked. I think I just got more aggressive with it. There were more technical changes that, that came about later uh, that allowed me to even serve better in my late 20s and in my 30s. Fantastic. So, but, uh, Jeff, interestingly, you reached the highest 68 in the world in doubles. Yeah. In 1997, uh, before, right, reaching the highest in singles. Yeah, my first year on the tour... Uh, I went from, I was, I started, so I turned pro in 1996. Mm -hmm. So remember, I'm 22 and a half years old. Again, all the pros in my era, most of them were at 22 were already top 50 in the world. They were, uh, I never played international juniors. I played Orange Bowl one time. And I lost to Alberto Barisategui. He was 200 mm -hmm. in the world as a, as a 17 year old. And I was just coming from Inner Mountain in Colorado. Yeah. So these guys were groomed to play on the tour. And I wasn't. And so I came out. I was 800 in the world. I was almost 23 years old. And I went and I played a satellite in Mexico. And I remember flying to Puebla, Mexico. And I played a guy from Guatemala that was 700 in the world. And it was altitude, pressureless balls in Puebla on slanted courts. They weren't even. Mm -hmm. And in about an hour, I lost 6'4", 6'1", to a guy 700 in the world. Here I was. I had just graduated from Stanford, won a national title. I was number one in college or top five in college, number one for my team. And I lost to this guy, and I just panicked. I was like, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? I'm never going to make it on the tour. But I regrouped. I got second on that satellite. I lost to Luis Herrera, who was a great top player, Latin player from Mexico, Davis Cup. Uh, and then, yeah. and then I did well in the summer. I won a couple matches. I played in the, uh, Indianapolis and then I did well in Portugal at a satellite. And within four months, I, I gone to 200 in the world. And then starting 1997, my first tournament was in Adelaide before the Australian open. And I remember qualifying and I drew Patrick Rafter in the first Ooh. round and he was 65 in the world. Eight months later, he won the U S open for the first time. So nobody really knew Rafter was going to go on to be a top five player at that time when I played him, but I hovered around 150 in singles for that first year and a half. I had yes, a hard, sorry, sorry, yeah. I don't mean to interrupt you. Going back to go ahead. Match. 
Yeah. Going back because I love I love Raptors yeah. games. If you got a <clears throat> how do you feel playing? I mean, how was the guy when I mean, how good was he was always serving and volleying? He was yeah. at the top of the line already. Yeah, I mean, he was coming off of an elbow injury. He was 65 in the world. Um You know, a guy like that, people say he couldn't maybe serve and volley in this era. I disagree. I, I, think, I think he would have given people fits today because he had an amazing kick serve. Uh, the kick serve came in at 110. It jumped. Mm -hmm. The courts now are slower, which actually would benefit him because he did well at the French Open. He got to the semis of the French, I believe. Um, and he played well on – I watched him play – I was Davis Cup practice partner, USA – against Australia in 1997 in Washington, D.C. And you had Philippousis, I believe. You had uh, Rafter, and you had the Woodies. And it was against Sampras and I think Todd Martin, because at that time Agassi was on the outs, and he hadn't made his big comeback yet. But Washington, D.C., slow, gritty courts, and he just gave people – just fits with his serve and volley with his kick serve his ability to move forward and he's my he is my model i know others look at like pat pat cash and rod labor and and other great volleyers but he was the first guy that i really studied that i was like this guy's doing it very differently than everybody else and so impressive and an even better person than he was a, a player a very humble guy you know humble humble beginnings in australia so playing him It was suffocating. You know, the best players in the world, you feel like they're suffocating you. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate. You know, I didn't play these guys week in and wait week out. I didn't win Grand Slam titles. But I had a chance to practice or play against a few of them. You know, I played, I practiced against Rios at Saddlebrook. I practiced with Sampras at Saddlebrook and at Queens. Um, I played against Ruzedski when he was four in the world in New Haven. And all these guys, whether they stayed back or came in, I practiced with Federer and Roddick. They, they just, you, they felt, you felt like they were on you. Like there was like a heaviness to their ball. There was an aggressiveness. And it was mental and physical that you felt their aura. And I guess that would be like if you played Lendl or Becker or McEnroe, it would be the similar feeling. I just had a chance to play those guys in the 90s that were very impressive. Amazing. So, uh, yeah, and, 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 you know, when you talk to this, uh, I talked to a player yesterday and, and she said that she didn't have the chance to play with the best players, you know, growing mm -hmm. up. And she, she's 27, and I think she was feeling that she missed that part of the game, having the opportunity to hit with better players. How important, and this is, please, send, uh, I have, I know some parents watching uh, right now. How important, Jeff, is for um, a junior player, 14, 16, hitting with older guys, stronger guys to get better? Now, I'm not talking about competing, just practicing, hitting balls. Oh, I mean, I think it's absolutely huge, and... You know, I think that's one reason I didn't make it higher in the rankings, because mm -hmm. if you remember, so what we haven't talked about yet is my Michael Chang match. That was probably my most famous match. I played Michael mm -hmm. Chang. He was number two in the world. And a lot of times when I start an interview, I always start with that story. Go I was ahead, 23, go ahead. I yeah, that. I was 23 ahead. years old. I was, I was playing in the U.S. Open. I had gotten a wild card because, uh, because I had had good results that first year on the tour. And I beat uh, Michael Thielstrom, who was about 65 in the world from Sweden in the first yep. round in four sets. And here I was playing Michael Chang. It was the first year of Arthur Ashe Stadium being open. There were 24,000 people in the stands. It was a night match on a Friday night against the number two player in the world, an American. And I remember that day preparing for that match. It was my first time on the big stage. I had played Thomas Muster. Uh, a month earlier at the Canadian Open when he was two in the world. And I was, I was on ESPN and Cliff Drysdale did the call. And I was up a set and a break and I let it get away. And I actually played Peter Korda earlier that year. And then eight Ooh. months later, he won the Australian Open. I was up a set sorry, and a break Jeff, on him. Sorry, you're too humble. Because you, you played with some of the best players, man, in that time. I, mean, I, I did. I don't know <laughs> if I'm humble, but what, what I'm about to tell you is that I played a lot of these guys and I was getting a lot of looks at them and people fear, actually people feared me. They feared my 125 mile an hour serve. They didn't want any part of it. And I was athletic. 
My problem is I actually didn't know how good I was. I didn't realize I was as good. My self image of myself, mm -hmm. you know, parents listening, players, my self image of myself was not high enough. When I would watch other players play, I would say, oh my gosh, they're so good. And then I would go play them and beat them and be like, wait a minute, I just beat them. But the problem is like I played Chang in that whole day leading up to that match. Oh, maybe phone call. This is amazing stories, you know. Jeff? Yeah, we lost him for a second. Maybe phone call. You see me? A phone call happens to me sometimes. Alonso, how are you? Nice. Can you hear me? Welcome to the show. Now, right now, we lost you for... Uh, oh, okay. Still, still the, the, the image is not as clear as it should, again. Okay. Um, uh, see I can if I can you move. Well. Okay. Yeah, maybe... Yeah, because I love your stories, man. I'm having so much fun and yeah. Oh, well, I got but yeah, I got a what? few. Jeff. Yeah, Jeff. Dinar Safina, Dinar Safina told me it's amazing. Exactly the same thing that you describe it about your feelings not seeing yourself good, right? Good enough to play against you know those guys. She felt the same against Serena Williams. Yes. She said, when I was playing against Serena, I felt that I, I, I couldn't beat her. I mean, I, she, I wanted, I saw strongly, but I, I couldn't. Amazing. She, I, she was number one in the world, and she couldn't overcome the strong presence of Serena. Mm -hmm. The aura, you know, from Serena. Amazing. Yeah, so, so I'm playing Chang, and yeah. can you see me all right? Perfect. The best time. Don't move. Great. <laughs> so, so I'm playing Serena. I mean, I'm playing Chang. And before the match started, all uh, someone's somebody. Yeah. Right. Some, I always remember your match against Spady, a six three in the third on grass at, at Rhode Island. Funny. Um, sure. Yeah. So 2004. See, he remembers it better than I do. I don't even remember that match. I don't have a great memory about a lot of my See, matches. You, hey, people are following you, man. More than yeah. you think. Yeah, so I was, I was worried. Here's the catch. Instead of thinking, you know what, I got I to gotta do the best I can. I'm going to find a way to beat Chang tonight or one point, whatever. I was concerned about embarrassing myself in front of the world. I didn't want to lose like one, one, and one in front of, on national TV. So I was, had all this anxiety, all this head trash around mm -hmm. whatever you do, Jeff, tonight, don't embarrass yourself. And so what happened is I went out to play that match and I actually uh, held serve my first two times. So it was two all, but I was playing really tight. And I finally took my first deep breath and I took this deep breath. And all of a sudden I started playing my type of tennis. I started just playing amazing. And for the next 20 minutes, I had Chang on the ropes and set point I'm serving. I hit a wide slice serve, serve and volley, backhand volley to the open court he can't get his racket on and i win the first set six four and the crowd absolutely Ooh. erupts and i always tell people that's when the match ended and they're like what do you mean it ended you just won the first set said well i backpedaled to the box i'm looking at my box i'm smiling and basically i had achieved my goal of not embarrassing myself because mm -hmm. i had won the first set And I took my foot off the gas and my level dropped about 5%. I couldn't maintain that level that the champions do for five hours. I dropped and I lost in four sets. Now, it was an entertaining match. I didn't embarrass myself. I achieved what my mind believed. But I really believe if I had done my inner work and I had believed that I could find a way to win, that I had the stamina mentally and physically to do it, I probably would have been top 50 in the world or top 20 in the world. But I kept losing to Korda and Mooster and Chang and all these guys that I actually had on the ropes because I didn't believe. And so when you asked the initial question about how important is it for juniors to play with pros, I think it's huge. Because remember, I grew up in little Colorado. I didn't play international. I didn't play in junior Wimbledon, French. I was not groomed by a world-class coach. I didn't train at IMG with Tommy Haas. I played Tommy Haas. I lost 6-4 in the third to Tommy in Memphis. I had him on the ropes. I had Red on the sideline mumbling, mumbling to himself. 
they were yelling at each other during my match, but I lost four in the third. I lost to Todd Martin, six and six. And I remember a year later, I saw Todd Martin. He said, you lost that match because you didn't believe. You were the better player. He knew it. He knew it. So I think when you're, you know, I was 150 in the world most of my career when I didn't have injuries. I think that I, uh, I just didn't have that self-image and that belief. Um, uh, another guy, he, he must yeah. have studied. Yeah, another guy. Yeah, so, so the thing is, is you got to play against the best. Like, that's why IMG works. And that's why mm. these places work. Because the young kids, they see with their eyes the great talents and the great players. And they practice with them. And they realize, wait a minute. My ball's just as heavy. I can hang with them. And when you practice with those guys behind the scenes, then when you get to the tournament, it's not, uh, it's not a mystery. And it was a lot of my tennis, it was like, do I, can I really play with the best in the world? And I think that I got to... We lost him again, maybe another phone call. <laughs> what a story, what a story. Uh, uh, so, you know, guys, he can't, I mean, go slower. I mean, it's, that's the way we speak here. So we, uh, I'm going to try to help private reason people because it's amazing, amazing stories. I mean, he's sharing. We we lost him. I mean, I'm so uh, sad right now because it's. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, the the interview is great. Unfortunately, we have some technical issues right now, but it's technology. Nothing is perfect. So, I I thought. Maybe if he goes, um, so Jeff, yeah, it's perfect. So Jeff uh, got an injured, serious knee and ankle surgery. So we're going to go through that later. So then he came back. Um, Can you see me? Right now, yes. We lost you for a couple of minutes. I was sharing with my... Can you see me now? About you. Yeah, not as clear as it should, but yeah, I can hear you well. Okay. I'm going to try to, yeah, I, I don't know what's going on, but I apologize. No, maybe, no, it happens. Listen, happens. Uh, the te it's technology. I said, I was telling the audience, it's the technology, but everybody's excited about the storytelling. I mean, it's amazing. So Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we were, we were finishing with the Chang match, and um, so yes, here's sir. what happened. So you won, you yeah, sorry, you... you you said you lost the match, but I lost you in, won the first set 6-4. That's right. <laughs> I, in my mind, I lost. I said, hey, I haven't embarrassed myself. Yeah. I've done enough, and I lost in four sets. Now, here's the kicker. The next day, I was in a midtown Manhattan hotel, and I was uh, sitting across from me was – Oh, sorry. We lost you again. We, we lost Called and – no, I'm sorry. back. We, yeah, you, you were in Manhattan, and then who? who was I was there? in a Manhattan hotel, and David Egdis was in the room, and Jeff Schwartz. And David Egdis was a junior agent for IMG, mm -hmm. and Jeff Schwartz was Pete Sampras' agent. And they sat across from the table from me, and they said, Jeff, you are a young American. You are, you, we love your game. We want to sign you. And I signed with IMG the next day. So I did the opposite. You know, at IMG in Florida, they sign everyone when they're 14. They signed me when I was 23. And uh, so I sign. But this is where the story starts to change. Because three months later, or I played the whole fall challenger circuit, and I had terrible results. I put a lot of pressure on myself, expectations. You know, am I really this good? And I didn't have good results at all. So in my off season, I was playing pickup basketball and I came down for a rebound. No one was around me and I felt pain in my ankle. Oh. And I went to the doctor and they said, hey, you've got a stress reaction. And they put me in a boot for six weeks. And when I got out of the boot, I kept having pain and that persisted for eight months. So I was misdiagnosed for eight months. I finally had surgery on my, my ankle. I came back six months later. I had practiced with Jim Courier a little bit in between that time. I come back, my first tournament back, I felt a click in my knee. I was playing oh. Daniel Nestor, the great Daniel mm -hmm. Nestor doubles player, and I beat him in Miami, and I still felt the click in my knee. And that was misdiagnosed for six weeks. 
and then I ended up having knee surgery. So in two years, I had two surgeries. I lost my entire ranking and I started over at 26 years old. And so in the first part of my tour, my career, I got to about 140 in the world in singles, but in doubles, I had played with multiple partners and had great results. I got to the semis of the Canadian mm. Open. I beat Vacek and Kavelnikov uh, and a bunch of other guys along the way. And so I probably could have been a top 20, maybe top 10 doubles player if I would have committed to it. But my dream was singles. I wanted to mm. see what I could do with singles. And so I started over at 26 years old after two surgeries at 800 in the world, starting at the bottom again at the futures level. And it took me four years to break the top 100 in the world. Amazing. So, Jeff, stay, please. Remain where you are because it's the best time. Okay. So clear. So okay. crystal, clear, crystal clear. So, Jeff, time flies. We have 30 it minutes. Does. 30 minutes, man. About, we can keep talking from this, uh, in the, uh, later. But uh, let me ask you, teach us. We all struggle. Uh, in Latin America, we have some good servers in the past, of course. But... Uh, It's been a, something that we were kind of missing link, you know, in our game. Solid yeah. players, warriors, consistent, variety, etc., etc. I don't want to go... Uh, sure. Longer, but, uh, I'm going to ask you, uh, I'm getting nuts crazy about... I'm going to go to specific, specific things of the serve. Okay. Crazy, be our teacher. And don't worry, because I'm going to translate this to the Latin American community later. Latin American okay. Community. I'm crazy about the toss in terms of the time, the clock. Mm. Toss the ball, 12 o'clock, 30, 1 p.m., 11, over your head, etc. So what is the best toss for the flat and the slice serve? Okay. Taking so, into account the clock phase, right? Before I answer the question. Okay. I need to mention something. So sure. I was thinking as you were talking, you know, the Latin American players typically don't have big serves. Mm -hmm. And one, and I'm sure you've thought about this, but, you know, in America, we grow up playing football, this football with, the, with Tom Brady. We grew up playing baseball. So we learn how to throw, whereas you guys are playing with your feet. You guys are playing football, yeah. soccer. Yeah. And so I believe that is a huge reason why the Latin American com uh, countries don't serve as naturally as the Americans. Mm -hmm. Now, you guys have great backhands. We have crappy backhands over here. <laughs> okay. But why? No, no. Why? What happened to the backhand in America? I, I don't know. I mean, I think maybe it's because we don't spend enough time developing our game uh, from the backcourt. You know, we want to end points. Our mentality is impatient. Yeah. We play on hard courts. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I was also thinking when David Nalbandian was coming up, I played him when he was about 120 in the world. And I played him in a challenger in Costa Rica. Wow. And I beat him like two and one. I mean, I beat him bad. And I actually didn't think he was that great. And there were a couple guys. I beat Fernando Gonzalez. I beat Joe Willie Sanga. All these guys when they were about 120 in the world. And literally a year later or two years later, all these guys were top 10 in the world. And so it's so funny how my career kind of was 150. And these guys, when I beat them, I was like, ah, they're okay. But they were only 18 or 19 and they just made huge jumps. But I think about if now Bandian served like Federer or if he served like Sampras yeah. or the big service, that guy would have been number one in the world because yeah. he was so uber talented off the ground in his court sense and, How, how, he, how he played the game. Um, and I love now Bandian's game, love his techniques. But um, in terms of the clock face, so I don't know if you're going to like this an answer, Daniel, but. No, no, listen, listen. It's, I, it's not about me liking it or not. You are the teacher now. Well, I'll be the teacher. You, you, people ask me about the clock face. I don't teach the clock face. Okay. I don't teach it. Perfect. So it's like. I love this, man. I love it's, this never, it's never made sense to me. Okay. I, if it doesn't make sense for me, then I can't have it make sense for someone else. Mm -hmm. And so I have to understand it first to be able to teach it. I think the mark of a good teacher is to really know it, to understand it, uh, to be able to feel it themselves and also explain it. So when it comes to the toss, and this isn't so, – so one, 
I, first of all, I'm a counterintuitive coach. So the way that I coach is, I think it's common sense. I think the way I teach makes sense. I think my lessons online make sense. I, this is the mm. feedback I've gotten, but it's different than uh, the way maybe more traditional coaches mm. would teach. Yeah. And so when it comes to the serve, and don't get me wrong, I teach a lot of the basic fundamentals as well. But when it comes to the serve, I don't use a clock face. And number two, I focus on improving someone's technique before I even think about the toss and the location of the toss. Because okay. I believe that the, the technique in, in the serve is probably the most flawed technique of any shot in tennis. You know, you can look at a forehand, you can look at a backhand, you can look at a slice backhand, you can even look at a volley, and usually it's not as messed up as player serves, especially on the women's tour. And so when you have so many technique issues with a particular stroke, I actually believe if you get the technique sound, the toss starts to go where it's a, the, the place that it's supposed to go, the place that it's most natural. So I want to set that stage before I answer your question about the location of the toss. So when it comes to, you said the flat mm. serve or the slice serve. Mm. <clears throat> A lot of it depends on the stance, Daniel, because oh. if I serve like Pete Sampras and I'm in a platform stance and my mm -hmm. stance is staggered with the back foot slid yeah. back, that is going to make it so that I'll be more turned in the beginning of my motion. And when I make contact, I'll also be turned. I won't be facing the net. So if I can be uh, slightly turned like Federer or Sampras at the contact point, then my toss is going to be more... Uh, above my head or maybe it's above for a slice server flat serve maybe it's above the right ear i go more by body parts okay uh, rather than clock face and so maybe it's right ear uh maybe it's a right shoulder but if i'm facing the net at contact because a lot of players serve facing the net especially mm -hmm. again more on the women's side than on the men's side then my toss as a as a right-handed player has to drift more to the right it has to be to the right. So your toss location will be impacted a lot by your technique, the amount of shoulder turn you have, the stance. If you bring, if you bring your back foot up uh, next yep. to your front foot and you open up your body and your hips early, your toss is going to be more to the right. So for a, if I were to teach someone a slice serve, then I would probably move the toss more that it's in line with the right, probably the right shoulder. That's where I look for it. Um, about the right shoulder to the right ear. Anything Perfect. to the left, now you're getting into that top spin kick range. But again, I don't talk about clocks. I usually look for a range uh, but with, the, uh, with the body point, a body part. If I were to draw a line through the shoulder or yeah. just to the, to the tricep, and I drew it over to the middle of the head, I want to see mm -hmm. that ball in that, in that range. And, and you, would you teach the same toss? For, I mean, you, I really understood flat and slice, because this yep. is another thing that keep the same toss. It's a feather repeat. They have this pretty much the same toss, so they keep the, the opponent guessing. It's a lot yep. of uh, deceiving. So I'm about to sneeze. Toss, Hold people, on. Yeah, so, so that's another thing. I get into debates with other – I got an email from a, a parent who's, who's a coach, and he's working with his son, and mm -hmm. he was debating me because he believes the toss for disguise should be in one place. And I'm all for that if you can do it. But what <laughs> I find is that a lot of players, they, they try so hard to keep the same toss. They either have too much of a slice toss, so then they can't mm -hmm. hit topspin, or they have too much of a topspin toss and they don't have a great wide slice. So my belief is that when I played on the tour, and again, I had one of the better serves on the tour. Uh, I had a big lefty serve. Uh, that was the one reason I could compete. I, once the point started, I was not as solid as the guys off the ground. I didn't like playing the, the Spanish guys and the Argentinians that kept the, the rallies going. I had to win with my serve. But I had different tosses. I would toss... Sometimes a little, I was a lefty, a little more to the left, a little more to the right. So I varied my toss, but here's the kick, kicker. It, let's say I decide to go with more of a slice toss, and I was in the mm -hmm. ad court. I'm a left-handed player in the ad court. Uh, so if I'm a right-handed player in the deuce court, 
I toss it more to the right and I want to hit a wide mm -hmm. slice. I can still toss it in the same location and bang that serve, nail that serve down the tee. And I can still toss it over my head and hit a kicker down the tee. I can still hit that same serve out wide. So I actually felt I threw people off by varying my toss. But then what I would do is I would vary the location of where I would hit the ball. And so, yes, to answer your question, if you could have one toss and hit all the serves, then you should do that. But if you're not as gifted or you feel like you can't get yeah. as much action on a wide slice, I don't think there's any problem with varying the toss. You just have to make sure you vary the location of where you hit your serve, that you hit some down the tee with the same toss, which is what I did. And I got a lot of aces on the tour by, by doing that, by mixing up my locations with my different tosses. Fantastic. Jeff, talking about the, the, the kick, anyway, the other day, one of the, my students said, Coach Daniel, what is the difference between the kick serve and the top spin serve? Are the same or different? I think it's a good, good question, right? Yeah, I mean, it is Because a good I'm question. Both. Kick, top spin, and w w which one is, you know, which one is yeah. different? So when I worked with John Yandel in my late 20s, uh, I was 28 years old. He's kind of known as the serve guru. He's got a website, yeah. tennisplayer.net. He got me into the Sampras stance. He taught me about ball position and how the more the toss arcs over the head. So as a righty, it's arcing more to the left, uh, the more topspin you can get on the serve. And the reason he believed uh, Sampras's serve was better than like Philippus's serve is that he had more topspin, more revolutions uh, per second on his ball than anybody else. Kind of like with Nadal's forehand has more revolutions than everyone else, Jack Sock. So that makes the ball a heavy ball, a heavier serve. It, does, it bounces higher. So if you can create more topspin and get the ball to bounce higher and jump off the court, that's, a top, that, that's more topspin on the serve. The kick is when – And the way I would describe it is when it bounces, it actually goes in the opposite direction. So instead of it bouncing up, it bounces up and it also bounces the opposite way of a slice. So I would say the kick serve is a more extreme version of a topspin serve. You actually want to have topspin on just about every type of serve unless you go with an extreme slice. But even Pete Sampras's wide slice serve had topspin on it. So having topspin, getting the ball to jump, Uh, that's important. And then getting it to jump the opposite way from a slice serve is the kick serve. They even talk about the American twist. I don't know exactly. what the American twist is. I don't know what the difference is between American twist and a kick serve. I have no idea. Um, so I just teach players. Um, I teach them amazing technique on their serve because I've studied it relentlessly over the years. And then what we find, again, is the ball position, the toss actually improves. I got one girl that used to face the net at contact. She had less shoulder turn. Her toss was naturally to the right. Now that we've gotten her more sideways like Sampras, uh, now her toss is naturally drifting over her head more so she has more topspin. But it's not like I said to her, hey, toss it at 1 o'clock. Hey, toss mm. it at noon. I might just say, hey, toss it a little bit more to the left another inch or two a little bit more to the right. But she started to find it as her motion, as her technique improved, she found the natural place where she needed to be to make the ball do what it was needed to do. Fantastic. Now, I'm learning a lot because I, I love that it. it's, it's much simpler. Yeah, because sometimes the clock face to me, even for me, is confusing. Yeah, one to seven and two to eight and seven and then left. And I just go left and right. And then yeah. I, I really work on the technique because remember, again, If your technique, if you have a low elbow on your serve, then it's going to be hard to hit kick so, or topspin. So now you have to toss the ball more to the right for a, for a righty. So yeah. if you see people with a, with a low elbow, you can't put them in a, a kick. You can't really give them a kick toss. So I believe people should improve their shoulder turn, their hip turn, their stance, their elbow trophy position, improve all of that their body being able to open up their spine when they, you know, when they, when they reach up with the racket drop, improve all of that. And then the toss, I think the toss starts to just go where it needs to go. And it's pretty exactly. cool when, when you don't have to obsess over the toss and it actually becomes a non-issue when it used to be a big issue before. Jeff, 
last question about the, the, the kick. Uh, we can talk for hours. I love hours, it. Hours, oh, no. hours. So, so, please, help me out. I heard toss the ball over your head for the top spin. Other schools toss the ball towards the left. And so which one you teach a, a 12-year-old, 13-year-old? Because it's not the same. If I'm telling you, right, toss the ball over your head versus tossing the ball to the left. So which one is correct? Which one is it, right? So what you're, what you're asking is, do you toss the ball for a 12-year-old more above the head or even more top, extreme? For, for the top screen set. Or even more extreme to the left? Yes. Okay. So... Whenever I'm teaching someone the topspin, I actually make them exaggerate the toss going pretty far to the left because here's how I do it. Instead of, again, I mean, I focus on that, but what I do is I make players focus on finishing their racket on the right side of the body. So if it comes around, if it comes, if it comes around across the body, then the motion, uh, the swing can go more forward and around. But if you have to finish on the right side of the body, mm -hmm. then the toss naturally will go more to the left. Now, the disclaimer I always give is that, listen, we're working on a specific swing path for the serve. You're only going to finish on the right side of the body right now. And then when you're done here on the right side, then we can bring it in front of the body when we're done. But I just want them to get the swing path down. The toss naturally starts going more to the left. But for a 12-year-old, what I'm going to say is not all 12-year-olds are the same. Okay. Some have uh, better shoulder flexibility. Some have mm. better rotation in their spine and their hips. You have to look at what their body can do. And you have to be able to assess if they can get into these positions. And you have to listen as a coach. I can't have every student toss the ball extremely to the left if one kid says, well, my shoulder's feeling a little sore, or the other one says, hey, I don't feel anything. So you really have to listen. Um, and you know that when you're t teaching the topspin serve, you can get the, the ball to toss extremely to the left, like very extreme. But when they actually play, it won't go that far to the left. I'm a big believer in exaggeration. So I think to learn a skill, you need to exaggerate. But then you need to come back more towards the middle and not be so extreme when you're actually competing or when you're playing, because you can get into a lot of trouble if that toss goes too far to the left. So I look at it more as an exercise to learn the proper swing path, but not necessarily, you know, tried and true. This is exactly what, you know, what you have to do every time. I'm a situational coach and I'm a situational player. I look at what the player can do. I look at their serve motion and then I make adjustments where, where their toss should be. Fantastic, Jeff. It uh, was wonderful information. Thanks. Yeah, uh, you're welcome. What drives me, drive me a little bit confused and not sometimes is the information about the stats. 80% between four shots and so. So uh -huh. kids get confused and they think that they have to uh, win the point within the first three shots, you know, because the stats and the professional tennis and so. What, do you, what is your point? What is your take about it? Yeah. Because... No. So it's very interesting to me when parents, especially, they chart their, their kids' matches and they will tell me, oh, they made 35 unforced errors in their forehand or they made 15. And my question back to them is, it's a deeper question. It's, okay, they made 15 forehand errors in the match. Uh, when did they make the errors? So was it Uh, was it the first ball? Was it the third ball? Was it the mm. fifth ball? When did it happen in the point? What type of forehand was it? Was it on the run? Was it moving back? Was it running up? Was it low? Was it high? Did the ball go in the net? Did the ball go wide? So I just, it, it drives me nuts when I hear people say, oh, he's making too many unforced errors. Well, that's yeah. just too general. I need to know, and I've watched enough tennis now that I know patterns. I know the patterns of play in terms of how people make mistakes. For example, one of the most common errors that I see in tennis is the forehand return of serve error in the deuce court. So when players serve out wide, I see that ball miss four or five times a set, and nobody really charts it or talks about it. I'm like, well, we need to just work on that wide forehand return all day long. It starts every game. 
It starts, uh, you know, it's deuce when you, if you can reach out and rip a forehand return, mm -hmm. like Djokovic did against Federer on that, when he was tanking, you know, many years ago and he reached out and he slapped that forehand winner by luck, won a grand slam. So understanding when you're making the air, what type of air you're making, and then you can go back to the practice court and say, oh, you missed three inside out forehands. Yeah. We got to work on your footwork on that ball, getting around the ball. It's not you miss three forehands. It's okay. the specific shot. Um, in terms of win, I am a big believer. So probably one of my weaknesses as a player is I didn't have a high shot tolerance. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't play 20 balls in a row. Um, I was a first strike guy. Um, and so I think I could have had as a player better shot tolerance and even develop drills uh, that could allow for that as a player uh, and even now as a coach. But today, when I'm watching tennis, when I'm watching juniors play, you, you mentioned the stats. I am seeing these kids missing returns, first balls, and, and serves. They're not, they're not even able to start the point. And so where I do think it's important to be able to have the shots, uh, shot tolerance mm. and have the patience, I do think we also need to spend a lot of time developing the return of serve and the first ball after the return on both sides. I know when I lost serve or I lost matches, I was missing a lot of balls early in points. And so training that skill, uh, I think, is very important. Of course, again, you've got to round it out by play, being able to play the longer rallies and have the stamina and do that. But I'm more of a guy in that camp of first strike tennis. doesn't mean you're going for winners. It just means you understand your patterns early in the point. Fantastic. I mean, uh, Jeff, uh, we have uh, seven more minutes. Okay. Uh, please take us to the website, the, the YouTube channel. Sure. Sorry. I mean, it's yeah. you. I, I watch your videos. Um, yeah. <clears throat> what was your vision, your goal when you started the – Yeah. I mean, it was amazing. I mean, so we only, have, out there. we only have seven minutes, but I have probably the most powerful story of, of our talk coming up right now. And that story is a 33-year-old player, that's me, who was about 300 in the world. I had still had some injuries in my 30s. The one time I broke the top 100 in the world, I was main draw into Wimbledon. I played main draw at French Open. I lost to Felix Mantilla. I was supposed to play Rafa Nadal at Wimbledon when he was 17 years old, and that was the year he had a stress fracture before he won his first French Open the year after. Um, And I ended up playing a lucky loser, Alexander Pea. Uh, that whole summer, I was main draw in these events, and I had plantar fasciitis in both feet. Mm. And so the one time that I was in all these main draws without having to qualify, I was injured. And so that happened for a few more years. My, my career was, you know, marred by injury. And so at 32, 33, I was at a crossroads. I was having a hard time getting on planes to go play tournaments. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a coach. I wasn't making a lot of money. I was struggling. I didn't have that fire anymore because I was tired and I was frustrated. And mm -hmm. the pain of losing, you know, there's so much pain when you put everything into something and you lose and you have to go back to that hotel room and you lay there. And that's why, you know, there's a lot of me mental health issues on the tour. There's, a, there's, there's some drinking, there's some drugs. You go out partying sometimes. Uh, because you're trying to find any way to deal with the pain. And so, sorry about that. Can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you. Yes. Yes. No. I, I can't hear you. No, I can't. Uh... No, I can't. I can't hear. You. Maybe. No. Yeah, go. Oh, what a shame. Just leave, leave, and then come in again. No. Oh, what a shame. Yeah, it's good he left. Yes, amazing stories. I mean, amazing. Yeah? The guy is a really role model for 
for all of us. So you should be able to translate this story to junior players, coaches, parents, and give you a lot of hope. Hmm? Hope to esperanza, eh? hope to, to reach a, a professional level of high or college. He was also All-American in Stanford University, one of the top colleges in, in the USA. Uh, we're just about to finish the, the live. Thank you so much for joining me today. It was a long day. Now we have to go and run some tennis lessons. So as soon as I finish this live, I'm going to go and teach some tennis. So uh, tomorrow we're going to have some more interviews, Friday as well. He didn't return. Let me see if he's, he's there. He's here. Okay. There you go. He's trying to come back. Connect. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, we have four minutes. Okay, four minutes. Okay, here's what happens. So, so I'm at this crossroads, and I go visit my family in Florida, my dad, who is my coach, and he had, I have three half-siblings. And my brother was 17 years old. I was 33. And I walked into his room, and I found him collapsed on the floor. He had taken too many drugs. He had an addiction problem. And in that moment, I quit the pro tour. I moved back to Colorado. I put my brother in rehab, mm -hmm. and I started coaching junior tennis players just like that. It ended just like that. And I found out in the first week of coaching that I loved coaching and I loved helping kids and players more than I enjoyed playing on the pro tour. Oh. I figured out that I was born to coach as, as great of a player that I became. I wasn't, I wasn't at peace. I didn't, I, I knew that wasn't my calling. My calling was to make a difference. And so I coached all these kids in Colorado and I had all these fun players and parents. And I did that for a couple of years but I realized, you know what, I can impact a larger audience. And so I started studying internet marketing and way back in 2010, before Instagram. And I launched my first course at the end of 2011 online, Jeff Salzenstein Tennis. Now it's Tennis Evolution and that we rebranded in 2015. So for the last nine years, I've been creating online content because I had this vision that I wanted to help millions of players get better at tennis. Even if they couldn't meet me in person, they could watch my videos. And we've been making YouTube videos and content ever since. And uh, that's one of my missions is to uh, move the game of tennis forward, share my story, share my insight, share my instruction so that players can get better and have access to this instruction. It's fantastic, man. I, I had no idea what you, about that. And my brother ended up, my, by the way, my brother ended up coming back. Uh, he, he, he had the addiction issues. He came to live with me. It didn't work out. He kept using drugs. He ended up going to prison for four years. He, he committed two felonies, and he was in Florida. Wow. He got out two and a half years ago, and, and halfway through his prison sentence, he called me, and he said, Jeff, I want to change, but I don't know how. And I gave him two books, Awaken the Giant Within from Tony Robbins, and the four hour work week by Tim Ferriss. And my brother started studying. He, he changed his whole value system. He studied personal development and entrepreneurship. And now he is a successful online coach and successful uh, public speaker. He's won a huge public speaking contest and he has a thriving online business in coaching. And that's my biggest success story. So I'm most proud of my brother for turning his life around. So if he can do it, if he can transform his mind and his body you can do it. Anybody can do it. And so uh, I want to leave everybody with that story before we go today, because if wherever you're at in life right now, you can create change and you can create success in your life. By the way, I would love to talk to him, to interview him. If you don't mind. We, we, yeah, I'll talk to him. Please. Jeff, it's thank amazing you story. From all, you know, Latin American community and some people from Spain watching. Thank you so very much. And the USA. Thank You're you welcome. I, I, I wish I spoke Spanish, but thanks for having me. No, 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 no. no. You, listen, they have to learn English. So, so I tell them, don't be lazy, guys. Study. <laughs> I thanks. Did it. I, I had my, pleasure. I did my job. So, so and if, if I did it, they can do it too, right? Yeah. Thanks for having me. Jeff. I wish you the best and I talk to you later, man. Thank you Pleasure. so much. Pleasure. Thank you. Amazing Thank you. Thanks, everyone. God Thanks for everyone for tuning care. in. Bye -bye. See you. Bye -bye. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thanks. Great moment.